Well, hello, I'm Martha Boyd, and I am interviewing uh, Bob Took for the Legal History Project of the Nashville Bar Association, and today's date is December 16th, 2021. Um, Bob, could you just tell us your, your full name, and then, uh, not to be rude, but could you tell me how old you are? My full name is Robert Dudley Took. T-U-K-E, and uh, I am 74 years old. And, Bob, where did you grow up? I grew up in Rochester, New York, just north of here. <laughs> just north. <laughs> I'd like to get a, a little bit into your early <clears throat> life and particularly your, your parents. Can you tell me about your parents and, and your siblings and your upbringing? <clears throat> Be glad to. Um, my parents were married uh, right at the end of World War II. Um, both were in the Navy. My dad was a uh, lieutenant in the Navy, and he was on a ship that was sunk in a battle off Guadalcanal. Uh, he was rescued along with most of the crew, thankfully, and um, he was sent down to New Zealand for R&R, rest and recovery, and that's where he met this lovely Navy ensign who happened to be a Navy nurse. She was from Nebraska, and that's my mom. And so they met there in New Zealand. Then he was assigned to yet another ship, an attack transport. And the attack transport landed Marines on Okinawa, and my mom got sent back to the continental United States, and they communicated by letter and we still have some of the letters that are kind of fun. And um, then he, um, on his attack transport after landing Marines and taking off dead and wounded at Okinawa, uh, was sent up with other ships to Tokyo Harbor. And he happened to be in Tokyo Harbor when the surrender of the Japanese occurred. He was physically there. Um, he ultimately uh, got sent after that ended the war. And so uh, his ship got sent back to California, and that's where my mother was stationed at a Navy hospital there. And they got together and decided that their romance was real. And so they got married uh, in Long Beach, California, and my dad's best man was a fraternity brother of his from Duke, who happened to be in California at the time, who was also a naval officer. So that was that. And so we grew up in Rochester. They decided my dad had come from Rochester and his father and his father, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my mom was perfectly willing to go to Rochester from Nebraska. She was raised on a farm, knew how to ride. She was magnificent as a mom and um, so that's how I grew up and I have three siblings uh, an older brother 13 months older a sister who's five years younger and one who's about eight years younger um, and uh, I went to University of Virginia from Rochester which surprises people and people would ask you know well, how did your father and mother, who's from Nebraska, how did they meet? And I would say, well, in New Zealand, of course. That's a great story. <laughs> and so um, having, having one parent having been to war is, is certainly unique enough. Having both parents is phenomenal. What was the attitude in your house growing up toward the military, and did your parents share their experiences with you? They, um, the attitude was pro-military in the sense of always honor them. And, um, but the World War II generation, the greatest generation, really didn't spend a lot of time talking about it. Uh, it's amazing. It's, it's just so fortunate that um, we captured some letters um, that were sent back and forth and uh, I got to ask some questions and when I applied to UVA and uh, got a Navy ROTC scholarship, uh, there's 
a way of seeking a Marine commission instead of a Navy commission when you graduate and when you get commissioned. And I sought a Marine commission. And I did that because the Vietnam War was on. And uh, I started uh, college in 1965 and graduated in 69, and that's when I was commissioned. Uh, I chose the Marine option in 1967. Um, the Vietnam War was well underway, and that's the one time my dad said to me, uh, now son, you know, I've supported you in all the things you wanted to do, but I've told you and you know that I landed Marines on Okinawa and took them off dead and wounded. Are you sure you want to seek a Marine option? And I said, Dad, I have to. They killed a couple of my very good friends at UVA. One guy who was a president of my fraternity before I was, and the other guy who was president of the student body, both were killed as Marine officers in Vietnam. I feel obliged and also proud and also determined to go fight. Now, Bob, at the time you went to um, to to Vietnam, you graduated. Well, or let's say let's move back to the time you were in at Virginia, UVA. Um, the Vietnam War was certainly already going on. I assume there had been um, there was some movement um, to protest the war. Some, you know, some student groups all over the country who were sort of anti-Vietnam and, and anti-soldier to some extent. And did you experience any of that at UVA, any of that anti-war sentiment? Sure. Tell me about that. And um, um, I even spoke on the steps of the rotunda, the, the centerpiece, if you will, of, of UVA uh, designed by Mr. Jefferson. And uh, students were speaking uh, all around. Uh, UVA, just like in other institutions that allowed it. Interestingly, in 67, thereabouts, not everybody allowed it, but they did it in Virginia. And uh, also the civil rights movement was going full guns back then. And so students talked about that also. And uh, so, so I talked about it. And I said, on the war side, I said, you know, let's be serious here. You don't have to agree with one another. We don't have to agree, but we do need to listen. And in the civil rights movement, there isn't any question that we need to make this correct. And in 1968, Dr. King was assassinated. And UVA shut its classes down and had everybody study the civil rights movement. I don't know of any other institution that did that. Um, little side. Uh, I got called into the Navy captain's office who uh, was in charge of the Navy ROTC, including Marines. I went in there and with a Marine major uh, who was head of the Marine Option Program and the Navy captain said, Midshipmen, what were you doing speaking on the steps of the rotunda against the war? And the major says, the Marine major says to me, don't answer that. He turns to the Navy captain, who was two grades senior to him, and says, Sir, with all due respect, this young man is a student at the University of Virginia. He did not portray himself as a midshipman. He was not identified. There was no agenda. He had no uniform. Uh, he was a student, and he's entitled to be a student. And then the captain said, you know, I'm going to ask you one more time, midshipman. And the major says to me to get out of here. I found out a couple of years later that's when my FBI record was begun. The FBI was taking pictures of everybody who was speaking and figuring out who they were. Wow. Um, what, what was your attitude at the time? So you're at UVA, you're training to be a Marine officer. What was your attitude about the Vietnam War? Um, I read a lot about it, and I was concerned about it because I also read uh, some of the really strong books that were written uh, during the French-Indochina War. And um, 
And ironically, I wound up reading a couple of books that talked about something called the Combined Action Program that the Marines had, where one-third U.S. Marines and two-thirds South Vietnamese militia worked together and fought together. So I wanted to get educated about it. Um, and so I, I, I had a strong attitude, frankly. I mean, I had a positive attitude about it, um, and I kept it. Um, so you graduated from UVA, you enter the Marines. Um, what was your training like to prepare to, I mean, I guess everybody was training to go to Vietnam, right, at the yes. time. What was your training like? Uh, the training was intense. And um, after the basic officer training uh, that we had to go do, if you wanted to go and train further, I, I happened to go uh, train as a tank officer. And, uh, but then I was sent to California to prepare uh, Marines who we have a saying in the Marines every Marine is a infantryman um, so I helped train Marines to go fight in jungles mangrove swamps ambushes all that sort of stuff and um, so that's I was very well trained um, it happens that when I was ready to go to Vietnam, uh, my orders got changed because the 3rd Tank Battalion to which I was assigned was being withdrawn uh, to Okinawa. By now it was approaching 1970, and main units from all the services were being withdrawn if not necessary. Um, I requested a uh, change in orders. Uh, so I could get to Da Nang, uh, which is where the headquarters of the Marines in Vietnam was. I asked when I was there to be assigned to a unit that would be out in the weeds. I wanted to go fight. I didn't want to stay in headquarters. I got that done uh, and got assigned to the Combined Action Forces. Well, tell me about getting that assignment, because we, we talked about that, and I thought that was such a interesting story. Well, I, I asked the commanding general who was in charge of training Marines to go fight. Um, I said, sir, this is going to be strange but to you, but I don't, I don't want to go to Okinawa. I want to go to Vietnam. And if you have anything at all that needs to be taken to Da Nang, to 3rd Marine Amphibious Force, I'm your guy. I'll take it. And he says, are you out of your mind? And I said, perhaps. And he says, well, it just so happens, Lieutenant, that I've got some top secret orders here, and uh, they need to be taken to Da Nang. So is that what you want? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, you're the man. And then I got to Da Nang, and I told the commanding officer there who was assigning new officers incoming, um, and uh, I said, sir, he was a colonel, I think. I said, sir, I don't want to stay in 3 MAF headquarters. I don't want to be in Da Nang. I want to be out in the weeds. I want to get out there and fight. And he says, lieutenant, we just lost a lieutenant a couple days ago down in Hoi An, just south of here. And um, is that what you'd be interested in? And I said, yes, sir. And he hollers out, Sergeant, I've got your lieutenant. And this Marine <laughs> sergeant says, follow me, sir. And we go out to a Jeep, and he tosses me an M16. That was our assault rifle. And he says, lock and load. And then he tells me where, as we're driving in the Jeep, um, you've got 12 o'clock to 4 o'clock. That's where I look to see for any enemy. And there was a corporal driving, and he got assigned part, in, and the sergeant took part. And zoom, off we went, and he says again, lock and load, and that means you chamber the round, you're ready to fire. All of a sudden, the adventure stopped, and the reality entered big time. <laughs> um. 
so you get to your unit and you you told us about the what the combined action program is so it's one third marines and two thirds of south, south vietnamese and you're commanding a a company right right with six platoons okay and each platoon had about 20 to 30 personnel in it, it all depended. Again, two-thirds of them were South Vietnamese village militia, and we had a corpsman in each one. Navy corpsmen are our medics. So you're new in country, and you're suddenly in charge of some over 100 people, keeping them safe and alive. Yes. Um, what did you do to figure out who's who and what's what? I mean, did you have non-commissioned officers that helped you and... Can you tell me about... I had good non-commissioned officers, mostly sergeants, um, and they had been there, and they knew what was going on, and they also knew that there were Viet Cong sympathizers uh, in every village, and so we always had two sets of orders for each night patrol, and all our patrolling was, almost all our patrolling was done at night. So we had one set of orders that I would give to the South Vietnamese, um, and uh, knowing that those orders were likely to get passed on to the Viet Cong. And um, then uh, I would have the second set of orders that I would give to my Marine sergeants, and those would be what we were really going to do. And that made, of course, getting support difficult. Right. And, um, you know, the, the, the movies about Vietnam particularly portray um, soldiers in country as being, you know, all unwilling draftees, you know, poor conduct, you know, lots of discipline problems, things like that. And it, from, from reading some of the materials you provided to me, it sounds like that was not your experience with your Marines. Not at all. Tell me uh, about your, your folks. That the, you my folks were uh, strong morale, high morale, uh, committed to what they were doing. Uh, most of them also had friends who were killed or wounded, um, and there was a lot of action that they saw. And they got to know the South Vietnamese with whom they were serving, and they became friends. And it didn't matter that there were going to be, and we all knew that there were going to be, um, some Viet Cong sympathizers um, who would get information that we wish they wouldn't get, but that didn't stop us from trying to do the best we could, and I'm so proud of my Marines to this day, and the corpsmen as well. And uh, we took it as our mission, we took it so seriously. And, uh, you know, when it was over, um, and my unit got transferred back to the United States, um, we landed in California on an aircraft, most of us on the same one, and uh, we then got sent to the nearest um, civilian Air Force base in San Francisco. And there was a bar in there, and we went into the bar, and I told the bartender that I wanted each of the Marines who were with me, it was about seven or eight of them, I guess. Uh, I said, I want each of them to have a beer. And he says, well, I'm going to have to ask for ID because these guys need to be 21. That was it the age back then. And uh, I said, no, they don't. I said, serve them a beer. They just came back from Vietnam. And he did. He says, but I'm not going to let you pay for it. So that's how it began and ended. As it should be. <laughs> yes. Um, while you were in country, um, you know, I'm sure there were a lot of experiences that you have relived in your in your mind or that really stand out to you. But can you just share with us some, you know, one of the more um, important or, or significant experiences for you? Sure. Um, one night I was taking a couple of the platoons out on patrol because it was word that the North Vietnamese were pouring in uh, to South Vietnam in 1970, and, um, and it was our mission to go find them if we could. And so it kind of changed what we were doing. We stopped 
patrolling around villages to keep them safe, but instead went out to try to find where the North Vietnamese might be. And sure enough, we went on the patrol. And when we were out on the patrol, uh, one of my subgroups uh, that we called killer teams uh, was out ahead. And they were looking, and I got a call on the radio. We used radios back then that said, we've got NVA with pith helmets, full uniforms, fully armed, in column, maybe 10 feet apart, too close, um, if they were on patrol. Uh, they're coming, and uh, we need to do what we can. And I said, stand by, get down, be quiet, and start counting. And he started counting. He got to about 20, and I said, are there more? He said, yes, sir, there's a lot more. I called air support Da Nang, and I said, I want every fixed wing aircraft in the Navy Army, Marines, Air Force, everyone you can scramble and get up. We've got NVA on the move in large number. And the air support officer said, I'm sorry, I can't. We have that area designated as a place that is moving toward peace, not war, and therefore we don't use fixed wing aircraft jets in, in that area. Uh, so I can't. I said, well, you can. He said, well, now, if you engage them, if you start a fight, you know, then we can scramble them for you. And so you can do that. And I said, well, you can get your behind down here and do that. Uh, I'm not risking my two platoons uh, so that you can follow your practice. Well, it turns out that I had made good relationships with some helicopter pilots, and they would listen to my um, back and forth with air support Da Nang, and they did. And so I wound up with Air Force, Army, Marine, Navy helicopters coming down there uh, where I was. and. Uh, the trouble with helicopters, as you know, is that they're loud. Womp, womp, womp. <laughs> womp, womp, womp. So the North Vietnamese uh, heard the helicopters sure. and knew they were on the way. And they tried to scatter, but they couldn't really scatter because they didn't know where they were or where mm -hmm. they were going. So the helicopters did a really good job. And there was an Air Force spotter aircraft uh, there, and he kind of took charge of each of the other services helicopters that were up there, and they they hit hard on the NVA. And you know, I I like to think that it it set a pattern. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier the the high morale of the Marines under your command, and anybody who's been in the military knows that high morale doesn't happen just by accident. I mean, it, it, it is a result of good leadership. What leadership principles do you think you exercise that sort of set that tone for, for pride and, and esprit and, and high morale? Well, you're very kind. Um, yes, the, my attitude uh, for leadership and Marines are all Marine leaders are trained this way. The first thing you do is accomplish your mission. The next thing you do is you take care of your Marines and your corpsmen. Uh, the next thing you do is you take care of the enemy. The first way you take care of them is to kill them. Um, but if you don't kill them and they're wounded, then you take care of them too. And you guard people who are wounded and you guard whoever you're responsible for. So in our case, village militia, uh, villages, village chiefs, people who lived in the villas and were, uh, you know, cutting rice. And uh, so it was always positive. We wanted it always to be positive. And it was hard, uh, especially by 1970, 71, when, when people were leaving, when, uh, and of course, as you well know, the, 
the morale of the citizens of the United States was not high, and the political problems in the USA uh, were very anti-war, and so it took strong leadership to uh, keep morale high. I'm proud that we did. Um, you mentioned the, the morale of the country, and, and you came home, I guess, you know, after about a year to a, to a country where the anti-war sentiment had, had intensified. Um, what was it like coming home to a country that had such a negative view, not just of the war itself, but even of the, the soldiers and Marines who fought? It was not easy, and the thing is, the, the military didn't, frankly, just didn't quite know what to do because uh, the war was so unpopular by then. And uh, the, what, what civilians did or, you know, regular citizens did is ignore, mostly ignore uh, the Vietnam veterans. Um, the Marines even put out an order that it should be expected that Marines who came from Vietnam and went to a civilian airport would um, not wear their uniforms into the airport. Well, that made me mad. And it made a lot of Marines mad. I'm sure it did soldiers as well. Uh, so I wore mine. Um, and, uh, and I was treated decently by most, certainly not by all. Um, you mentioned in, in some of the writings I read um, in advance of this a, a party that you attended shortly after arriving back in the States. Can you describe that? Well, we got into a civilian airport and walked up to a bar and uh, the bartender uh, was there doing what bartenders do and I said I want a beer for every one of these Marines. And they all had some kind of Marine uniform on as well as I did. And he said, I'm sorry, I can't. I only can serve people who are 21 and over and these got older and these guys don't look that old. And I said, uh, it doesn't matter. They were patrolling a couple of days ago in the jungles or in the rice paddies in Vietnam and you will serve them a beer. And the bartender said, you're right, I will, but you can't pay for it. And so that was a, that was a morale booster right there. Um, how soon after you got back from Vietnam did you go to law school? I went to law school starting in 73, 1973. So, Essentially, I had nearly two years um, to serve stateside, and I was assigned to the National Security Agency, which is the most senior security institution in America to, these, to this very day. And that's when I learned that I had an FBI record resulting from UVA. Uh, but um, the NSA didn't mind that a bit, although they did send some people back to my hometown and ask neighbors questions about me. Um, but I Just somehow kept my top, <laughs> <laughs> I kept my top secret clearance. Now, were you married while you were in Vietnam? I was married while I was in Vietnam, and, um, and I still am the same wonderful lady. We've been married for 52 years, and um, and we wrote back and forth, and uh, but when I came home, uh, we burned the letters. Why did you do that? They were too personal, um, and it was a strange time. And people were, people really didn't want to hear about it. On the other hand, they were really curious about it. Does that make any sense at all? It does. And so we just decided we're not gonna we're not gonna have them, mm -hmm. and a lot of them were very personal. Um, 
I don't think they violated any secrecy rules or anything, but uh, we just decided that that was that. That must have been hard on Susan to have you in Vietnam in such a in a in a combat role in Vietnam. Um, you know, what was her perspective when you got back, and did you have a hard time reconnecting? Not no, not really. Um, first of all, I got to take a, an R and R trip to Hawaii, and she got to come and meet me there. So we got to spend a week in Hawaii um, about midway through my tour. And we got to stay in a beautiful hotel on uh, Waikiki uh, Beach. And uh, the hotel manager uh, had listened to Susan about not spending a lot of money on a room. So I got there first and he gave me the key to the room that Susan had reserved properly. He's not spending money. And it had no view of the beach, and it uh, it was quite small, and it really wasn't what I had in mind. But I, she did what I asked her to do. So I went back down to the front desk, and the manager was down there, and he said, "Well, what did you think of your room?" And I said, "Well, just to be honest with you," uh, and I had a marine uh, khaki on. I said, "It's." It's, it's not what I'd hoped for. It's perfectly fine. But he said, well, look at this one. And he tosses me another key. And I go up to the top floor, second highest floor in the hotel. I walk into the room, turning the key. And here's a room that goes all the way to windows which open onto a lanai, which is Hawaiian for balcony. And I've got this magnificent suite with its own balcony, and it was incredible. So I went back down, and he said, well, what'd you think of that one? And I said, I think that one is incredible, but I can't afford that. He said, yes, you can. He said, it's the same price. And so he gave us that suite. How wonderful. Yeah. So then when I got back, you know, we, we were ready for, for happiness. And her parents gave a nice party and, you know, people gathered there. And thank God there was an Army Vietnam veteran at the party whom I knew well and Susan knew even better. And uh, he saw that no one was talking to me uh, except very, very you know, low level. And he came over to me and he said, I'm going to be your battle buddy. Oh. And so we just spent that party together. And it, it, he, he was just terrific. He just, he made me, he helped make me come back and ironically wound up being a bank officer and he was my, he was our uh, mortgage banker uh, who helped us finance uh, when we bought our first house. That's lovely. It's funny that in the midst of a political system, you know, coming back to a, a country that wasn't really welcoming you with open arms, you, you still had these amazing experiences of people who were kind and compassionate and, and just knew exactly what you needed at the time you needed it. It is true. And... And they got better. People, we Americans got better, especially post 9-11. And you know that because you had that experience. Yeah. And, and I know some other people who had it as well. And that was a whole different ball game because that was so horrific, 9-11. Uh, and then we had soldiers, Marines, airmen, and sailors that went back overseas only this time to... Afghanistan and to Iraq and to other places. And, um, you know, the American public uh, was better. And uh, I'd like to think they're better now, but I think it, it's waned a bit. Uh, and in particular, the, the abandonment of Afghanistan has not been taken well. 
uh, and you know, frankly, the the abandonment wasn't handled well, in my opinion. But it's just my opinion. Well, and the the abandonment of Afghanistan, um, as you mentioned, we've just been through that. We've just seen that, and that was horrendous to see. But as a Vietnam veteran, did that evoke any memories for you of a similar pullout from from Vietnam? It did, um, frankly, uh, because when the decision was made uh, to retreat from Vietnam uh, in 1973, uh, that was done largely for political reasons. And soldiers and Marines, sailors and airmen, weren't uh, asked about it and weren't given the opportunity to, uh, to yet win that war, which we could have done. But it was a political decision, so there was, there was some analogy available there. Um, and, you know, politics needs to be out of war. War needs to be fought by people who fight and need to be led by people who lead and who need to carry on, as I said earlier in our conversation, uh, and a whole lot of them did uh, in uh, post 9-11, and including Marjorie Eastman, who wrote a beautiful book called The Frontline Generation, and it's about her generation, your generation, the people who went to fight uh, uh, after 9-11 and knew that they had to do something special and something difficult. And she did and you did. Well, and I appreciate that. Um, when, when you were in Vietnam, so um, I think one of, the, one of the things that tends to lead to these atrocities that we, hear, we heard about in Vietnam and, and since, and you know, certainly in our wars, um, is, is this dehumanization of the enemy, so tr seeing them as less than human. And it sounds like, based on your experience, you had South Vietnamese in your unit, you were responsible for them, you had to trust them to some extent, and I know that was, you know, you had to, to temper that a bit, but um, how did that influence your, um, your attitude over there or, or, or your, your treatment of the Vietnamese you know, the good guys and the bad guys. Well, it, it really made a difference. Um, so I would go into a village and I would be invited to uh, crouch down in the hut uh, occupied by the village chief and he would present me with some kind of Vietnamese uh, meal uh, with chopsticks, of course, and it might be monkey or dog. Uh, sometimes we could get lucky and have it even be some duck or something. Or at but, least that's what they told you. <laughs> but it was interesting because the tradition was always to keep your head lower if you're Vietnamese, you keep your head lower than the village chief's head. And Vietnamese aren't tall as a generation or as people. You know, they're relatively short stature compared to Anglos. So I, it was hard for me to get my head lower than the village chiefs and uh but uh, the word got out that i kept trying to crouch down and down and down and they finally started telling me no 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 you do not need to do that so that was good and the other thing was <clears throat> when we would have wounded as i mentioned earlier wounded uh, Viet Cong or north vietnamese uh, i would have my marines guard them and uh, make sure that they could be collected by their personnel and taken for appropriate medical care or if they needed to be taken to be properly buried Buddhist burial, then that would occur as well. And that added to our good morale and pride and it changed the way the Vietnamese treated us because they respected that hugely. I've lived with that ever since. I went back to visit Vietnam in uh, 2016 with my son, who wanted to go. He wanted to see where I had been when I fought. 
when I was ambushed, etc. And they were as nice as they could be, the Vietnamese, where I still call the North Vietnamese because they won. Um, <clears throat> but all of the people that we interacted with uh, treated us well with one exception where I had a, a Vietnamese, actually a Vietnamese Marine senior officer pull his AK-47 on me and lock and load. Uh, but I managed to uh, do a hasty retreat <laughs> and uh, decided I wasn't going to be killed when going back to visit with my son if I was managing to survive the whole war when I was there. We're, we're glad you came out of that Thank unscathed. You. <laughs> so um, you were telling me uh, before we started today about your, your path to law school, and it was you, you had sort of a funny um, vignette about how you had already <coughs> had a plan to go to Vanderbilt Law School, and could you sort of well, the, yeah, the vignette is that <clears throat> I was invited to compete for a full scholarship called the Patrick Wilson Scholarship to Vanderbilt. And this was when I was still at UVA. So I came to Nashville. I uh, met with the people that were going to make the decision. They decided they wanted to offer me the scholarship. I said, well, the thing is, I can't accept it, not for four years, because I'm going to be in the Marines for four years, and I'm keeping that commitment. So the head of that group <clears throat> said, well, we'll be back with you, and it was at a, it was at a gathering, and uh, so they didn't leave. And they came back to me and said, well, we're just going to hold the scholarship for four years. And by golly, they did. And then when I came back and out of the Marines and reported to Vanderbilt Law School, uh, they had another gathering to uh, welcome the new members of the class that uh, were in, some, in that scholarship. And the head of it, I said to him, I must tell you how grateful I am, but also say that I know that likely the only reason I was awarded the scholarship is the committee thought I'd be killed and they'd never have to fund it. And he told that story for three or four years. Um, your time at Vanderbilt Law School obviously was good enough that you decided you wanted to make Nashville your home. It sure was. And I had great classmates and, and the school still has great students in my opinion and I was fortunate enough to get to serve as the editor-in-chief of the Vanderbilt Law Review and uh, and get to work with faculty members and so forth and it's still that way in my opinion and uh, yes that was a reason why we decided to stay in Nashville um, and uh, not to mention that my wife's from Nashville, but that she was glad to go to New York, which is where I had a, an offer from one of the biggest law firms in New York called Sullivan and Cromwell. And I spent a summer up there clerking, as we called it then. And we really enjoyed New York, but we decided we were going to continue in Nashville. And I'm so glad we did. And so, Susan. Tell me about uh, tell me a little bit about your legal career and some of your focus areas um, during your legal career. When I started practicing, I was with a firm that <clears throat> would be called as midsize, and that meant that it had probably twenty or so lawyers in it. That that wouldn't be midsize today, <laughs> um, but it was a wonderful firm and had true leaders. Uh, leading the firm, uh, and it was called Ferris Warfield in Canada, and um, so I started out doing a lot of commercial work and finance work. I had done that at Sullivan and Cromwell, um, and the firm had some really good clients, and I got to work with banks and bank holding companies and 
uh, at one time uh, uh, got to be the lawyer for our institution that merged with another institution to create the largest bank holding company in Tennessee. Um, and that was a challenge and fun. And um, But then uh, Susan and I decided we wanted to start a family. And one thing that Charlie Warfield did was family law in that firm um, and uh, occasionally would do adoptions. And so his legal assistant uh, knew about adoptions. And so I had told him that we might like to start a family by adoption. And by golly, we did. So we adopted our son, who was from Peoria, Illinois, and our daughter, who happens to have been from uh, Tennessee. And, uh, and I learned in doing that that our adoption law wasn't very uh, useful in Tennessee. It was, it was not efficient, and that's the nicest thing to say. So I wound up getting assigned to a thing called the Adoption Law Study Commission uh, by then Governor Sundquist, uh, but it was really held, led uh, by uh, uh, one of our esteemed senators at the time. And uh, so it had a judge that did adoptions on it and agency personnel, people who had adopted uh, children and people who had been adopted as children uh, and all kinds of agency heads and, and all of that. Uh, so, so it was, it had about 13 or 14 people and uh, the guy who really ran it was Senator Douglas Henry and we spent about a year going across the state of Tennessee all pro bono and interviewing people who had been adopted and who had been in the adoption process and learning what had gone wrong and what had gone right. And at the end of that period, Senator uh, Henry said, well, now then uh, uh, we're going to uh, work on uh, revising Tennessee's adoption laws. And Mr. Took uh, and Mr. Johnson, uh, you're going to be the drafting committee. Uh, do you volunteer? <laughs> and of course, for a Marine, I'd have to say yes. And I did, we did. And we, over time, got to uh, rewrite Tennessee's adoption law. Uh, doesn't mean we wrote every word of it, but we moved it around. We made it work better. Um, it was well received. It did get challenged. There were uh, some people actually from out of state who were nervous about the fact that people would be able to uh, keep from being contacted by people that they didn't want contact with who didn't show a need or a true legitimate desire to be in contact. So I got asked to litigate that and uh, got, to, uh, got to argue it before the Tennessee Supreme Court. And it's probably my favorite thing I ever got to do as a lawyer. And we won, uh, we won unanimously. And it's still the law. And we think it's the best adoption law in the nation. Um, and perhaps as a result of that, I got to help form something called the American Academy of Adoption Attorneys, which is a nationwide organization. Every state in the nation has adopted the law, has enacted the law. It's not a federal law. Now there are five Canadian provinces and Great Britain and France and some others who have membership, but it was a terrific opportunity and I got to be one of the founders and I got to be the president uh, of it and uh, over time. And once again, it, it changed my life as a lawyer because I still did that other stuff because if you want to make a good living, you can't just do adoption law. <laughs> and, uh, and so I still did that. And I also was very honored to represent Meharry Medical College as an outside counsel 
and I ultimately became the outside counsel, issuer counsel for the Industrial Development Board of Nashville and Davidson County. So I've had the opportunity to work with really strong people wanting to do really good things. So I've been blessed. Well, I know many, many couples who have adopted children with your assistance have feel truly blessed by the work you did to help them um, in, you know, expand their families. Uh, I know Chancellor Pat Moskal was one of your clients and um, you know, that's certainly got to be incredibly gratifying to, to watch these kids that you helped get placed with loving families, watch them grow up and, and go out in the world and do good. It's a true thrill, especially this time of year. I get Christmas cards and holiday season cards from families that adopted their children who are now 18, 19, 20. Uh, it is such a joy and it keeps happening. So blessed. Um, in your role as counsel to the Industrial Development Board of Nashville and Davidson County, uh, you've been in that role since, what, 2009? Yes. That's a long time, and Nashville's changed just a little bit since then. <laughs> Tell me about your role as, as counsel to that board and, and you know how, how you think Nashville has changed in, in good ways. Well, um, I was asked to become outside issuer counsel because... The I had been bond counsel, and which is complicated, and it helps do tax exempt uh, financing. And the Industrial Development Board wanted to have its own counsel that wasn't bond counsel on each transaction, but instead kept the interest of the issuer, which was the Industrial Development Board, in sight. And usually, I would have to issue an opinion as counsel to the board that the, the documentation and so on was proper and uh, enforceable and that sort of thing. And so I just got to do it and they, those who were running the IDB back then uh, were good enough to pick me uh, to have that role. And uh, as a matter of fact, I was just joking uh, with one of them uh, yesterday about how I think the real reason I was chosen was that my law office allowed me to walk to the courthouse from my law office because that's where the Industrial Development Board met back then. Uh, now it meets at uh, the Fulton Center there in the Ben West area down on 2nd Avenue, so that wouldn't be the case now. And in addition to being sort of a, a transaction lawyer, you've had the uh, somewhat unusual role of also being a litigator kind of at the same time. <laughs> can you, can you, which is a, the type of practice that many attorneys don't have anymore. Most are pigeonholed into one, one or the other uh, transactions or litigation. Tell me about your litigation experience in any um, cases. Uh, the, the one you just mentioned obviously was amazing. Um, arguing before the Supreme Court in the adoption law case, but any other um, particularly high um, visibility uh, cases that you litigated? Uh, there have been. As a matter of fact, I handled one that involved uh, financing and fraud on, some, on a group of churches, and it wound up going to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, which, of course, is up in Ohio. And, um, and when I went up there to argue before the Sixth Circuit, uh, I said to them that I was the appellee and we had prevailed, you know, at the district court level. So I wasn't going to take up a lot of their time, um, but really did want to rely upon a very careful decision made by the then district judge. Uh, in Middle Tennessee, and one of the the head of the of the panel uh, that I argued before in the in the Sixth Circuit said, "Oh, ho, ho, Mr. Took, I'm not going to let you come all the way up here from Nashville and not argue before this body." 
no, have at it. <laughs> and it was fun. And I did that, and we won. Awesome. And what it did was it made uh, the churches that were being abused, frankly, they were being defrauded. Uh, it freed them. And it was, you know, something that made me feel real good. And the other, the other litigations I got to do were where uh, businesses were not treating each other properly. And so most of the litigation, if it wasn't adoption related, uh, was going to be commercial related or finance related. Bob, now, um, I think it's fair to say that none of us have just pockets of our lives that are separate from the other. So, I, you know, we talked a lot about your, your time in the Marines, um, and I'd like to talk a little bit about how that influenced your legal career, how that influenced your approach to practicing law. Well, it, what it did was it convinced me that I needed to follow those principles. So that meant that I needed to work very hard I needed to protect my clients. I needed to do what was best for them. I needed to make sure that others weren't taking advantage of them. I needed to be sure that they weren't imperiled by what they were trying to do to themselves. And you've had that experience also. Um, so that led me in that direction to really want to be of service. Well. On the other hand, or as part of that, I learned that there were veteran groups that needed help. And they needed help for a variety of reasons, uh, one of which was that, you know, frankly, there were too many different what they call veteran service organizations that were not working together. And so, and you have been the president of Operation Stand Down Tennessee. I was before you. And Operation Stand Down brought together a lot of these veteran service organizations, either officially or unofficially, in something uh, which was a Middle Tennessee Adoption Service, excuse me, veteran service organizations got together to work together to protect veterans, to find them homes. Initially, there was very, very large numbers of uh, homeless veterans, particularly Vietnam veterans, who had fallen on hard times, who had suffered from PTSD. Uh, and then, and, and so Operation Stand Down uh, had seven uh, homes for uh, veterans who were homeless, and they got to go and live in those homes if they would follow procedures that were very clear. And it helped so many people, veterans, turn around. And then when the next generation came along, uh, homelessness ceased to be the major problem, the biggest problem. It remains a problem. Uh, but then other problems, mostly getting a good job, getting a good education. Uh, how do you transition from being uh, military person to being a civilian and still have your pride, uh, still value your friends, your battle buddies, your the people you relied on. Uh, and so Operation Stand Down modified what it offered to people and created computer labs and created people to advise on, on resumes and how to turn a military resume into a civilian one. So it was and I, you know this as well as I, it just, it's such a blessing to get to do that. And no, you don't get paid for it, but so what? What you do is you get paid for it all right by what you see that happens, uh, that saves veterans, and it's still going on now. And you and I both know that. And uh, uh, I'm just so grateful for the opportunity to continue to work with veterans, and I always will, even after I retire at my ripe old age. Well, I'm grateful for your, you know, I, you're right. I came in right after you were president for a long time, and, and really, when you started 
with Operation Stand Down. It was you and, and then Executive Director Bill Burley, and, and there was no template for what you were doing. I mean, there was no, there was no clear path of what we were going to do here. You just, you know, took a lot of risks and, and took a lot of um, personal, you know, risk yourself and just said, we're going to help veterans, here's what we're going to do. And, and that included buying the facility that is now the beautiful facility on the corner of Edge Hill and 12 South now, you know, the Operation Stand Down building. Yes, that was another blessing, and uh, it worked. And uh, the Industrial Development Board helped finance it without my involvement, whatever. Uh, I recused myself from that. Uh, and then one of the major banks in town decided to buy all the bonds and finance it itself, and uh, it wound up being... Uh, a, a facility that Operation Stand Down wound up owning for essentially zero cost. Well, it's a it's a beautiful facility, and I know from working with you that uh, throughout our time as trying to to make it look what you know like what it is now, you would say things like, "Oh, I'll just call this guy over at the bank, or I'll just call this guy I know, and we'll get it done." And just this sort of can-do attitude was just prevalent throughout your leadership as president of the board, and it was just inspiring for everyone to see. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I have to say that the bank that stood up when we really needed it was then First Tennessee, which is now First Horizon, uh, and it. It's a bank that was just totally uh, responsible, dependable, and uh, I'm so grateful for them. And in addition to your hard work and efforts for Operation Stand Down, you've also been on the board of the Tennessee Veterans Homes? I, I was. Uh, I was actually chairman of the board of Tennessee State Veterans Home. Um, and we have that organization has veterans homes. Um, in several places in Tennessee, and it, they provide homes for veterans who otherwise wouldn't have them, especially those who have some kind of need to be in a home where they will be observed and cared for and that sort of thing. And they do a terrific job, but at the time I was asked to take over, uh, they were being sued. Uh, by the Department of Justice, and uh, it was it's a horrendous misunderstanding, and we managed to get the lawsuit dismissed, um, thankfully, and uh, and it's still thriving. The state veterans' homes are still thriving in Tennessee, so that's something I'm proud of, and and um, and I also have enjoyed so much being president of the board of Ten Green. Uh, land Conservancy, and that's just what it sounds like. It's a conservation organization that has conserved land all over Tennessee, uh, from various waterfalls and hillsides and trails and that sort of thing, uh, and, and they've done it with great expertise and devotion and volunteers and that sort of thing. So, so once again, an opportunity to do, in my opinion, what's right to keep Tennessee green. As a matter of fact, we got legislation passed called Forever Green Tennessee, and that helped it happen. All your public service, Bob, um, do you think um, it was in some way healing or therapeutic for you after your your marine service? Well, uh, certainly it wasn't therapeutic after marine service because by and large my marine service was superb. And But the coming back from Vietnam and the way we were treated, uh, all of us were treated, was difficult. And, you know, back then, so many had PTSD, uh, but it wasn't recognized. The Department of Defense didn't recognize it. The VA didn't recognize it. Uh, but lots of service people had it. 
And it's still the case that every day, 22 veterans commit suicide every single day. That has not improved at all adequately in all this time. And we need to keep at it. Uh, now the VA has turned around. The Department of Defense has turned around. Strong veteran leaders like you have helped people understand, especially those in government, uh, what needs to happen uh, to keep people safe. Um, and, you know, it, it is going to get better, but it needs to get a lot better uh, than that. And of course, more veterans commit suicide than any other identifiable group of people in the United States. Wow. That's sobering. Um, Bob, tell me a little bit about your, um, your involvement in, in politics um, and, and what that has done for you and what you feel like you know, you have done for for Tennessee's political landscape. Well, I have been, once again, I feel blessed. I was, uh, I helped uh, Bob Clement um, when he decided he wanted to run for uh, the U.S. Senate. And, uh, and he was a congressman at the time. And we had a really strong experience. And I got to go up to, interestingly, uh, got to go up to Nantucket, and that's where I met uh, a guy named Joe Biden, who happened to be up there and was already a senator. And I, uh, I met others up there as well. And John Kerry uh, was one of the ones I met up there, and that allowed me to become uh, head of Veterans for Kerry in Tennessee. And, uh, and on and on it went. And then in in about 2003, uh, I was asked to become chair of the Tennessee Democratic Party, and I agreed, and I got to serve in that role through 2004 when we had Harold Ford running for the Senate and darn near beat Bob Corker, but did not beat him. Um, so that led to still more activity within the party, and I was still chair of the Tennessee Democratic Party. And um, so after that defeat, and along came the possibility that we were going to have somebody else run for president uh, that would be unique, uh, and I was called up to Chicago to meet with this guy named Barack Obama. And I did that, and it was a remarkable meeting. It was like reading his book, uh, and or one of his books, in the uh, having to do with truth. And I got to talk with him one-on-one -on -one for probably about 15 minutes. He didn't know me. He didn't know what I stood for or anything. He didn't have to. He just was straightforward, honest. And I got to see and meet with the directors of his campaign, and it was so organized. And they had, uh, they had a timeline already. And uh, uh, he, uh, he just, his whole team seemed to be so organized and everyone was so nice and we had people there from essentially all over the Midwest and the, and, and the northern part of Southeast and uh, some Southwest and California and, and all met. So I came back from that weekend in Chicago, long weekend in Chicago and met with my then law partner and said, well, I just met the next president of the United States. Um, my then law partner was a very close friend of uh, the Clintons. And he said, and of course Hillary was running, and he says, you've got to be kidding me. I wasn't. So, uh, so 
they asked me to run for Senate, uh, the Obama campaign did, in Tennessee because they thought, and I think they were right, uh, that because some people in ten Democrats in Tennessee knew who I was and they would be more likely to come out and vote, not just for me, but for Obama. Um, and uh, I ran against Lamar Alexander, who's a fine gentleman, and we, we ran a, a hard campaign, but a responsible campaign, both of us did. And both of us had told our staffs that we were not going to tolerate any negativism uh, in the campaign, and we were not going to tolerate falsisms. Uh, too bad that didn't stay the same. I was going to say, you, you know, that's a, that's a tall order. Uh, there, certainly there's a tendency to, to go negative, and, and you, were, you were both gentlemen in that, and um, Lord knows we, we could certainly use more of that attitude or that sort of shared um, belief system amongst our candidates now on both sides of the aisle, of course. I agree. Um, could you tell me a little bit about your, um, your faith? Well, I'm an Episcopalian, and as we say in our church, um, um, a born Episcopalian. What that means is that you're born an Episcopalian, your parents are an Episcopalian each, or one at least. And uh, so that's how I was raised. And um, it's been another joy for me, and I go to St. George's Church, I'm a member and have been, and I've been on the vestry, which is like its board of directors. And uh, I've had a number of roles there, including uh, teaching communion, youth communion uh, to the youngsters there, the young people who are 13, 14 years old. Uh, it's been such a blessing, and I love it, and it's given me something yet more to do uh, and bring my faith into what I do. And one of the tenets of the Episcopal Church is that if you are aware and are with someone who is not baptized as a Christian and they are potentially in their death throes, uh, even if you're not a priest, you can baptize such a person and allow that person, therefore, to have a shot at going to heaven and meeting with our Lord. And I got to do that in Vietnam with a Marine who was very seriously wounded. And I, he was begging for somebody to help him meet the Lord. And I got to do it. So I stopped his bleeding. I revived his breathing. And then I baptized him using my Book of Common Prayer. Wow. That's a And he survived. Did he really? Yes, he did. <laughs> I hope it's not because your baptism wasn't going to secure his death. Ironically, a chaplain came out uh -huh. and on, a, on the helicopter that took this Marine back to uh, Naval Hospital to have his life truly saved, mm. medically saved. The chaplain turned out to be a Roman Catholic, and Roman Catholics are more likely to go out into the field in danger as chaplains than any other religion, and I'm not saying that to put down anybody else. It's just that I saw who was out there. Yeah. And, and that individual um, asked me if it would be all right with me if he re-baptized that Marine. And I said, I would be so honored. And he did, and he recognized the baptism as being valid. Wow, that's awesome. What a powerful story. <laughs> um, Bob, I know you're, with all your accomplishments, um, and, and all your public service and your and your legal career, you're in one of your most important roles now, and that is the role of, of grandpa. Can you tell me a little bit about your 
expanded family now? Oh, we are so blessed again. We have two grandkids. Both are children of our daughter, Sarah. They live in Columbia, Tennessee. Um, and uh, her husband and father of the two is named Travis. And his last name is Growth, G-R-O-T-H. And he is a leader in Murray County as a economic development leader. And he's a splendid guy. And um, so Otis is the boy, and he's nearly five and a half, and a great guy, and constantly in motion, uh, which is what young boys do at that age. And he's playing youth soccer, way youth, right. like five and six <laughs> years old, and loves that. And our granddaughter, uh, is so beautiful and her name is Evelyn and she's about two and a half years old and she's just a joy also and uh, she is so interested in books and in toys and in stuffed animals and as girls that age are uh, and boys and um, so that's taking up uh, a good bit of free time that we have, uh, and we're mighty happy to have it happen. Great. Um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to see, is there anything else that you would like to share with the Nashville Bar about your life and your experiences practicing law? I think what I would like to share is that Please don't ever give up. Um, it, it takes some people sometimes to do things that don't seem quite right in the sense of not being practical. Uh, don't ask how much money it's going to take or how much money you have to give. Do what's right. And we all know that there's plenty of places in the Bible where you can go and find that. Uh, it's not intimated. It's very obvious. So do what's right. And that is really helping, I hope, uh, our society deal with the COVID crisis. And it needs to. Um, and I happen personally to believe that includes uh, getting one's uh, vaccine, getting vaccinated and also getting a booster because of these uh, related but not identical uh, COVID uh, diseases. And when, when people like Senator Bill Frist, Dr. Bill Frist, who was the head of the Republican majority in the U.S. Senate, uh, he is one of the most articulate um, strong-willed, reasonable, scientifically driven uh, uh, speaker on this topic. And he is all for it and says that if you don't do it, what are you doing? Who are you endangering? What kind of game are you playing with people who need to be protected? And then Dr. Hildreth, who's the president of Meharry Medical College, he's another one. And he's the one who led the fight to try to stop the worldwide spread of infectious diseases, in, in that case, uh, uh, infectious diseases that were sexual. And, uh, and he's known for it. And he also is a known spokesperson in favor of going that extra mile, getting those vaccinations, getting those boosters if needed, uh, wearing the mask if needed, and following what people are saying, and, and protecting medical service people, you know, the people in the hospitals, the people, the nurses, the staffs that are exposed every day. And, you know, that's what we need. 
we need that kind of thing, and we have it in Nashville. Uh, we're just blessed. Bob, that's a that's a great message. And although I hope that when people are watching this 10 years from now, COVID is a, a thing that is long past, I think your message will still resonate, which is care about your fellow man and do what you can to protect yourself and others um, where you can. So I, I thank you for that message. And, and thank you for never shying away from difficult and controversial topics. I think that's one of the things that many of us admire so much about you. Oh, thank you. That means a ton. Well, I've certainly enjoyed talking to you today and really appreciate everything you've done for the veteran community, the legal community, and, and Nashville at large. Well, thank you for taking your time, not only to do this interview, but to study and prep for it. And that made it so much easier for me. It's my pleasure.